great white shark, most feared of all the creatures that roam the seas. I saw a great tail sort of before my unbelieving eyes. The tail went up, went down alongside of him. He disappeared and, and, and was gone. I had sighted a fish when all of a sudden a great thrash and a crunch in my left hand side. So it grabbed me around the chest and I knew instinctively that it had to be a great white. A shark was a nightmare creature that performed a nightmare function that was as atavistically primeval as imaginable, that is, consuming a human being, being consumed by another animal. The great white shark is the most awesome and powerful of any animal in the sea. This prehistoric predator, with its reputation as a man-eater, has fired people's imaginations for thousands of years. And it is this reputation that has kept the great white shrouded in mystery. Today, science is taking a new look at this creature in hopes of uncovering the truth behind the legend. The primal fear this shark inspires exploded into contemporary consciousness with the 1974 release of the blockbuster movie, Jaws. Jaws capitalized on a very old, very deep, and virtually universal dread. It was a nightmare turned into entertainment. When the book came out, there was an awful lot of fear around the beaches that summer, and it was coincidental that at that time we were also making the movie on Martha's Vineyard. And it was a kind of healthy, thrilling fear. The movie changed everything. It put the fear into people in a, in a tangible way. Jaws was fiction, but shark attacks do happen. In fact, the nightmare of Jaws almost turned into reality on one 4th of July weekend in 1982, here at Stinson Beach, only 10 miles north of San Francisco. Stinson, a popular swimming and surfing spot, was crowded that holiday when lifeguards on duty spotted the fin of a great white shark close to shore. Alarmed, they quickly cleared the beach and everyone managed to leave the water safely. But as great white shark sightings continued, the lifeguards imposed a swimming ban that lasted for 11 days. Even though great whites had been sighted here before, it was rare to see them so close to the shore. This event added to a growing list of frightening incidents along the California coast. In fact, shark sightings are nothing new to San Francisco. The early Spanish explorers named this peninsula Tiburon, their word for shark. But today it is not the sightings that are the problem. Shark attacks on humans have reached a new and alarming level. Facing the prospects of a continuing threat, 
the citizens of San Francisco turn for help to the California Academy of Sciences Steinhardt Aquarium. This aquarium is not just a popular tourist attraction, it is also a major marine research facility and it has become the West Coast Center for White Shark Research under the leadership of its director, Dr. John McCosker. Since the film Jaws, there has been a worldwide fascination with the great white shark, and with good reason. It is the single most ferocious fish on our planet. I've spent the last 10 years of my life studying the great white shark, both above and below water. And for each answer I obtain, I raise two new questions. There is so little known about great white sharks today because no one has had an opportunity to study a healthy great white shark swimming on a 24-hour basis. No aquarium has been able to keep a great white shark alive for very long, and observing them in the wild is difficult. Although the anatomy of the great white has been studied, answers to many of the most basic questions that fascinate biologists remain unknown. For example, scientists have no idea how many great white sharks there are, or even if the species is in danger of extinction. They don't know if these creatures migrate or stick to specific territories. They don't know how often great whites breed, or how many offspring are born to a single parent. And even something as basic as how much a great white needs to eat on a regular basis is still to be discovered. Scientists do know, however, that great whites are found living in every ocean of the world, that they prefer coastal temperate waters, and that occasionally they will attack human beings. Exactly why is still a mystery. Most people think that more shark attacks occur in Australia than anywhere else in the world. In fact, that is not so. The majority of great white shark attacks occur within 100 miles of San Francisco. The area is known as the Red Triangle. Between Tomales Bay, Monterey Bay, and the Farallon Islands, more than 30 attacks have taken place in the last 25 years. And with every shark attack comes the media's reaction. Lewis Bourne's body was found in this rocky cove six days to the hour from the time he was last seen surfing nearby. Within an hour after Lou Bourne's body was discovered, biologists and other investigators converged to make their studies. Deceased remains has a large laceration with part of the trunk missing from the left uh, 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 hip area extending up to uh, the left armpit area. That shark attack was a terrifying experience for all the surfers of California. I have the board that that surfer was upon when he was attacked by a white shark. You can see the large bite that was taken by the shark that also probably instantly killed the surfer. This large frozen individual was captured near San Francisco and allows us an opportunity to estimate the distance between the puncture wounds compared to the same teeth on this shark. The results? The attacking shark was considerably larger than this 16-foot, 2,200-pound shark. Yet the largest white shark ever captured was five foot longer and weighed 7,300 pounds. As awesome as that is, I'm told that there are even larger sharks in the ocean, yet no one has ever captured them. There are more than 350 kinds of living sharks, yet in the public's mind there is only one, the super predator, the great white. This creature is larger at birth than the average of all other living adult sharks. Its growth, although poorly understood, appears to be a massive addition of girth with length, such that a large adult might weigh 50 times as much as a yearling. A great white may be large enough to swallow a person whole, but it usually doesn't. In typical cases, the shark attacks from the rear, bites, and swims away to wait for the victim to bleed to death. Most victims, however, are quickly rescued. Deaths from shark attacks are rare. In fact, the likelihood of being attacked by a shark is less than that of being struck by lightning. Clearly the fear of shark attack is out of proportion to the risk, but the horror lurks in people's minds. So why do sharks attack people? The California Department of Fish and Game tried to find out. 
In 1980, it published a report analyzing the 47 shark attacks that occurred along the California-Oregon coast over the last 50 years. The report looked at several factors, but no obvious pattern could be found. Each attack seemed different. The study found that the attacks occurred at any time of the day and every month of the year, with a slight peak in July. Attacks occurred in shallow water, less than three feet deep, and in deep water, more than 100 feet. Attacks occurred in clear water and in murky water. The only discernible pattern was that 79% of all the attacks happened at the surface of the water. This was true for swimmers and divers alike. In fact, when they examined the activities of the victims, they found that historically most were divers. However, in the last five years, many more have been surfers. Why this preference for surfers? John McCosker has a theory. Here we are in the friendlier environment of the aquarium's marine mammal tank. The California waters have not been that friendly to surfers within the last decade. There have been more than 13 attacks by great white sharks upon surfers, often with fatal results. It appears that surfing, although an old sport, is now placing man in a very precarious position. The development of short surfboards, the modern short maneuverable boards, makes us appear like white shark food. Now, imagine, if you will, what a shark sees when a surfer is lying sideways on the board with his hands and legs along the sides. The attack usually comes from behind and beneath. Of course, the silhouette of this surfer looks very much like the white shark's favorite food, the elephant seal. A large population of elephant seals, along with a variety of other marine mammals, live along the California coastline. Looking at the marine ecosystem here will help explain the increase in the number of shark attacks in Northern California. These are the Farallon Islands, 28 miles off the coast of San Francisco. These remote islands support a large population of pinnipeds, the family of marine mammals more commonly known as elephant seals, seals, and sea lions. In 1968, a year-round research station was established here to monitor the mating and breeding habits of these different populations. Individuals have been tagged and followed so that today a careful record of their activities exists. Knowing that great white sharks depend upon mammals for protein, Dr. McCosker often visits the Farallons. He is interested in the white shark's diet and hopes to calculate how frequently they attack pinnipeds and how much the white shark needs to eat. Telltale scars like these are proof of white shark attacks. Positive identification can be made by looking at the shape of the wound. The location of the bite indicates the shark made a surprise attack from below. These bite marks leave no doubt about who is at the top of the food chain. Dr. Bernie LeBouff, a scientist at the University of California, Santa Cruz, is a pinniped expert. He has followed the behavior, the habits, and survival of these marine mammals for nearly two decades. Presently, you find thousands of uh, marine mammals uh, near Año Nuevo and other parts of California today. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, there would have been very few of them uh, in many of these places. And the reason for this is that uh, these animals were exploited by sealers in the last century. In the early 1800s, many of the populations were, were made virtually extinct. Uh, the elephant seal, for example, uh, during the nadir of its, its history in 1880s, may have been reduced to as few as uh, 50 animals, perhaps less than that. 
the Marine Mammal Act of 1972 prohibits people from harassing, injuring, or in any way uh, uh, affecting these animals. Today we have over 75,000. But can just one species in an ecosystem be protected without creating waves somewhere else in the food chain? I suggest that within the last century, we have experienced a very abnormal situation in California waters. Let me show you why. You see, at one time, marine mammals abounded along our coast. Elephant seals, seals, sea lions, and sea otters were plentiful. But with the 19th and early 20th century hunters, their numbers were brought so low that several species were nearly brought to extinction. Recently, however, Efforts to conserve these animals have brought their numbers back, and their numbers continue to climb. Along with the reduction of marine mammals was the reduction of their major predator, the great white shark. You see, the great white shark was nearly starved into local extinction without food to prey upon. And with conservation, their numbers have also climbed. Now add mankind to the equation. In the middle of this century, man went into the water in hordes. Scuba divers, surfers, skin divers, all entered California waters, and as their line has grown, it has crossed the white shark line, and when that has happened, it means trouble for us. And this trouble is twofold. On the one hand, the marine mammals need the white sharks to limit their population and keep their species healthy. This helps us, too since marine mammals compete with fishermen for resources of the sea. On the other hand, when there are more white sharks in the oceans, the chances of shark attack increase. The problem for us is finding a way to maintain a safe balance. In 1982, when the number of shark attacks reached an alarming level, California lifeguards called a meeting with John McCosker here in the Bay Area. They were hoping that his research would help them make the beaches safer. It's not the number of attacks that's so interesting, it's the frequency of attacks whereby in history we would see an attack every few years. In the 50s we would see an attack every couple of years. It looked like it was happening more often, obviously. It was because there were more people going into the water. Then something very strange happened about the time the film Jaws came out. There were, if you recall, uh, seven attacks in Northern California that summer. I think it had nothing to do with the film Jaws. I think it had a lot to do with the things that Jaws eats. Then the Rare and Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973, and so all marine mammals were then protected and are protected and should be protected. And that's when we started to see the incredible increase in the number of attacks. That was not a massive infusion of surfers and abalone divers. People had been in the water by that time in great numbers. John, can you describe the actual process by which the shark bites and kills its prey? The prey is at the surface basking, hyperventilating, whether it's an abalone diver or an elephant seal waiting to make its next dive. The shark is beneath it, looks up, sees the silhouette, probably 20, 30, 40 feet away makes an upward rush towards it. Shark rolls its eyes backwards, lifts its snout. It can't see at this point. Its upper jaw teeth are coming out of its mouth. It takes a huge bite mid-body, lifts its prey out of the water. If it's a diver, 180 pounds is nothing. It just lifts them clear out of the water, holds them there momentarily, drops them down, and then slowly swims away from it, surrounding it. Swims far enough away so that it can't be gouged and bitten by the prey and waits for the prey to bleed to death. Uh, I don't think you can prepare for the remote possibility of a white shark attack on a California beach. I think the only thing you can do is try and prevent people from going into the water in an area where there is a high probability of white shark attack. One person who witnessed a horrifying attack was underwater cinematographer L. Giddings. He was diving in the Farallon Islands with his business partner, Leroy French, when a white shark surprised them. I saw a great tail come up over his head behind him. He couldn't see it, but he could see reflected in my eyes the, the terror and uh, total amazement and could hear the rush of water behind him. And of course, he'd already been hit once. 
So he knew it was coming again. And uh, sort of before my unbelieving eyes, the tail went up, went down alongside of him. He disappeared and, and, and was gone. I continued on sort of in dream time and, and got to him or got to the spot where he disappeared. He wasn't there. I looked around frantically and he popped up next to me, clawing and spitting and carrying on and screaming then a number of octaves above what one would think humanly possible. And somehow I got around him and under him and got him on his back and, and, uh, and took off with him. The shark didn't hit him again. I, I expected a great lunge. Uh, to come, usually they go back and, and seem to attack the same victim again and again. We got to the boat, uh, a frantic scene there, lifted him out of the water, blood pouring all over, in fact, all over me, and uh, got him on deck, applied a tourniquet, uh, a helicopter took him out, and uh, two years and, and uh, 450 stitches later, he was walking again. Leroy French was lucky. The waters off the Farallon Islands are known to support a sizable white shark population. Yet despite their prevalence here, so close to San Francisco, white sharks are difficult to capture alive. Most of the specific information that is known about white shark anatomy, in fact, has come from dissecting dead sharks caught by local fishermen and donated to aquariums. This allows marine biologists like John McCosker to closely examine the mechanics that make the white shark such a remarkable predator. This five-foot individual is a newborn, probably no more than three months old. Yet at three months, the great white shark is able to eat most anything in the ocean. It has a combination of body parts from tail to nose that allow it to swim at high velocity, capture most any struggling prey. This tuna-like tail is different than most other shark tails. It's nearly symmetrical, and one thrust of that powerful tail can make the shark accelerate at 25 miles an hour. It has a cut water at the base of its tail, allowing it to cut its tail back and forth through the water. And the stiff dorsal fin, often seen cutting the water in Hollywood films, is important to keep the shark from rolling. The five slits along the head are the gill slits. Most people think that all sharks must swim in order to breathe. This is true for the white shark, but not true for many other sharks. They can sit quietly on the bottom using muscular energy to pump water across their gills. These sharks are cold-blooded. That is, their body temperature stays the same as the surrounding water because their circulation system allows the body heat to escape through the gills. The great white shark is different. It swims with its mouth open, forcing the oxygen-rich water to flow through its mouth and out its gills. Through this ramjet ventilation system, the white shark breathes without expending any extra energy to pump water across its gills. When we were students in school, we read that all fishes are cold-blooded and all mammals are warm-blooded. Well, more recently, we've learned that many mammals can hibernate or become cold-blooded at night. And in like manner, we've learned that four living fishes are warm-blooded, and the great white shark is one of these. Its circulation system is designed to retain its metabolic heat. Much of the blood supply circulates through a single artery vein pair running just under the skin along each side of the fish. The arterial blood, shown here in red, picks up oxygen from the gills and carries it to the muscles of the body. As the fish swims, its contracting muscles generate heat, and as the blood flows through the muscles, it releases oxygen and picks up heat. The blood then returns through the veins, shown here in blue, to the gills to be reoxygenated. Heat transfer from the veins to the arteries actually takes place within a unique structure called the rit mirable, or miraculous net. The net is a dense network of microscopic veins and arteries shown here in a magnified cross section. These vessels are positioned so closely to each other that the heat of the venous blood is transferred and warms the cooler arterial blood. 
For many years, scientists have known from dissection that this structure existed in white sharks. But how it actually worked was demonstrated when John McCosker and his colleague Leighton Taylor performed an experiment in 1980. Using an acoustical transmitter designed to measure both water and body temperature, they set out to verify the workings of the great white shark's unusual circulation system. All right, we can see him right under the boat, so it's maybe make it five meters. To do this, the transmitter had to be implanted 14 inches into the swimming shark's muscles. But trying to hit a fast-moving shark is no easy task. This thing's pointing directly at him. He's off the port side of the boat. Approximate distance? The transmitter sends sound waves, which are translated into temperature values. The results of this preliminary experiment confirmed their hypothesis. Coming this way across the stern. This graph shows the results. The shark's body temperature stayed warmer than the surrounding water. For example, when the water was 21 degrees centigrade, the shark's body temperature was about 25 degrees centigrade. When the shark dove into deeper and colder water, seen here on the graph, its body temperature also fell, but stabilized several degrees higher than the water. Fluctuations like these indicate that sharks don't maintain a constant body temperature as warm-blooded animals do. Nonetheless, their limited warm-bloodedness does give them a predatory advantage. It is the white shark's circulation system that gives them strength and speed, making it possible for them to prey successfully on faster-moving seals and sea lions. Sharks also have a unique system for sensing their prey. The sensory pores located on the top of the head, primarily along the snout and lower jaw, are called the ampullae of Lorenzini. These electromagnetic detectors are capable, theoretically, of sensing the pulsing heart of another animal a thousand miles away. Yet in the ocean, with all of the background electrical signals and noise, the shark uses this sense to feel the struggling pulses of its prey item at the surface as the shark attacks. And in that white, bloody froth, the shark, using a sonar-like sense, is capable of recognizing the position of its prey when it can't even see it. Now, in the film Jaws, we saw the great white shark attacking boats. Well. Truth is stranger than fiction because the great white shark very often does attack boats. Not because it likes to eat boats, but because it confuses the electromagnetic cues that the corroding undersurface of a boat produces. The large black sinister eye of the great white shark is adapted to low light level vision. It wasn't until this year that scientists realized that it possesses both rods and cones within the retina for both black and white and color vision. But at the moment of strike, the shark doesn't see its prey. It rolls its eyes tailward in order to protect its eyes from the struggling nails and teeth of the seal upon which it feeds. The white, viscous flesh protects the eye and the shark senses its prey with the electromagnetic receivers on the forehead and on the snout. This combination of characters from the tuna-like tail, torpedo-shaped body, stiff fins and sensory receivers allows the white shark to capture most any prey animal in its way. And at that final moment of strike, its ability to thrust its upper jaw forward and outward allows it to grasp the escaping seal or sea lion. John McCosker and a colleague, Tim Trekas, developed a new system for making accurate observations of white shark behavior. Here, McCosker demonstrates. By tracing each separate movement of a shark bite while slowly advancing the film, he is able to record precisely how the jaw moves for each tenth of a second. He is able to analyze the mechanics of the shark bite. 
With the use of high-speed motion pictures, we are able to dissect the feeding behavior of the great white shark in minute detail. These pictures, taken at 200 frames a second, allow us to understand each one one-hundredth of a second of a white shark feeding event. Like all sharks, the great white shark's jaws are loosely fitted. That is, the upper jaw is not fixed to the roof of the mouth, allowing it to extend outwards, as we see in the films. This allows it a slight edge, a little reach, as its prey item is attempting to escape. The event begins with a snout lifting. Then the lower jaw teeth are raised and pierce the flesh of the prey item. Then the lower jaw and the upper jaw are at the greatest distance. The upper jaw then is brought down exerting several thousand pounds of force and in doing so is able to scallop out a 30 pound piece of flesh from its prey item. This is incredible when you realize that less than one second has occurred and 30 pounds of flesh are gone from the prey. It's not surprising that Peter Benchley entitled his book and film Jaws because it is the jaws of the great white shark and its teeth that mankind fears most. Now these jaws from a 2,000 pound, 15 and a half foot shark are quite formidable. But imagine, if you will, what each single tooth is capable of doing. The white shark's tooth is uniquely shaped. It is triangular, sharp, and serrated. This tooth allows it to gouge huge bites out of its normal prey items, cutting through the thick flesh and skin of the seals upon which it feeds. The white shark's tooth is considerably different than other kinds of sharks. For example, the tiger shark, which has a sharp but very asymmetric tooth shape, allowing it to cut through the skin of sea turtles. An incredible mechanism in shark evolution allows the white shark to always have a sharp fresh tooth when it comes to feed upon its prey items. The shark, in fact, intends to lose a tooth after it bites. This nine-foot specimen shows you a sequential row of teeth, like a dental conveyor belt, which allows the tooth to be wiggled free from the jaws of the shark and replaced by a new sharp and fresh tooth after every meal. This tooth came from a 3,000 pound, 16 and a half foot great white shark. Imagine, if you will, the shark that possessed this tooth. It was Megalodon, thought to be extinct several million years ago. Because sharks lack bones, the only knowledge we have of fossil sharks is based upon the teeth. Now, a reconstruction of the jaws based only on this teeth would suggest that the shark was 50 to 90 feet long. A man could walk upright through its open mouth. Peter Benchley realized this when he wrote Jaws and suggested that perhaps Megalodon still lives. Could Peter Benchley have imagined that his recreation of the monster Megalodon in his first book, Jaws, would be translated into 15 languages and become America's most successful first novel since Gone with the Wind? What was the Jaws phenomenon? And why did the public respond so emotionally? Here at his home in Princeton, New Jersey, Benchley reflects on what is so terrifying about sharks. No question, the most dangerous animal who has ever plagued man on Earth is Pasturella pestis, the plague louse. He's killed more people than <laughs> any other critter in the history of the human race. However, they see a shark, they meaning the populace in general, and specifically a great white shark for all of the reasons of his size and his solitude and, and his, his general menace, his air of being a devil. 
a shark is an animal in an environment in which they might well find themselves, either by intent or by accident, falling off a boat, going swimming. He will do the worst thing possible, which is eat you, in the worst way possible, which is alone, helpless, out of reach of, of any assistance, and in a grotesque terminal way. This terror has been a subject of the artist's imagination for centuries. In a famous painting done in 1778 by the American painter John Singleton Copley, Brooke Watson has fallen into the water of Havana Harbor. He is about to be attacked by a very large shark. There is fear in the eyes of his mates. They're reaching out, trying to save him while he strains to grasp their hands. Incredibly, Watson survived the attack. He lost his leg but returned to London and eventually became the Lord Mayor. A century later, Winslow Homer created his most famous painting, The Gulf Stream. It depicts the lone survivor of a demasted sailing vessel. His mates are in the water. Their blood flows as the sharks attack them. In the background is an onrushing tornado. This picture so horrified the public that Homer apologized and said, tell them it is all right. He is picked up by a ship. Both then and now, shark attacks instill fear and fascination. Why do we have such a powerful response to such a rare event? After Jaws came out, a panel of seven psychiatrists was, was brought together by some publication or other to analyze why this phenomenon had occurred. And to abbreviate their findings, it was basically that shark was a nightmare, a, sh a shark was a nightmare creature that performed a nightmare function that was as atavistically primeval as imaginable. That is, consuming a human being, being consumed by another animal, and that it somehow, and believe me, it was accidental as far as I'm concerned, touched a truly primal nerve in an enormous number of people. Here at Hollywood's Universal Studios, a motorized, larger-than-life shark performs daily for hordes of tourists. The megalodon of Benchley's imagination has made a comeback. The monster myth is perpetuated and reinforced, and the revenues roll in. But has Hollywood gone too far? Has the fantasy started to create a reality of its own? There was an immediate reaction, which I was very upset about. Uh, people regarded the killing of a shark as a great macho triumph. And Valerie and Ron Taylor, the great Australian cinematographers and divers, called me and said, you don't understand what's going on down here. People are going out on these slaughter trips to prove some sort of macho nonsense about themselves. And sharks are being killed left and right, and we are worried that there may be actually uh, an endangerment of some of the species. No, not me, the fish. <laughs> In an unprecedented killing, four great whites were pulled out of the ocean near the Farallon Islands and docked at Half Moon Bay, south of San Francisco, in October of 1983. Could this formidable creature be in danger of extinction? No laws protect them, and fishermen consider them fair game. You have seen them before out there, oh, yeah. huh? Yeah. And out here, too. I've seen a lot of them here, and, you know, anywhere between here and the Fairlawns is, is the area that we fish. A lot of people think that they're really fairly unusual around here, although there have been some uh, attacks. No, they've been here the whole time. What are you going to do with them now? Take them up to San Francisco and freeze them. I've got a, a guy out there will freeze them for me and go from there. This fisherman is preserving his sharks in the hopes of creating a tourist attraction. There is money to be made from dead sharks. An average jaw has 300 teeth and could sell for about $1,000. In Australia, some have sold for $5,000. Certain people think killing white sharks is the answer to the shark attack problem. But Dr. McCosker is concerned about the implications of such an attitude. 
people have suggested that we kill the great white sharks. But that would be ridiculous. That would be very dangerous because the great white shark is the last predator upon these seals and sea lions that we compete for, for food and for space in the ocean. Perhaps the answer to this complex problem lies within a better understanding of the biology and behavior of all of the players in this oceanic drama. When we better understand the seals, the sharks, and our own species, we will better be able to predict what will happen in the future. Making accurate predictions depends upon expanding what is already known about these creatures. And one of the best places in the world to do this is Dangerous Reef, South Australia. This area is well known for its large marine mammal population and untold numbers of white sharks. In January 1980, an expedition brought Dr. McCosker and a team of biologists and filmmakers to gather new information on great whites in the wild. What do you think about a better lee or a better place to work? The expedition hired Rodney Fox, an Australian spearfishing champion, to locate the great whites. Although it is often difficult to find them, Rodney is experienced enough to do it. Ever since he miraculously survived a great white attack, he's devoted his life to understanding more about them. It was the South Australian Championships, Spearfishing Championships in 1963. I had actually won the South Australian Spearfishing title the year before and was very keen to regain it. And there were 40 divers swimming for four hours. We had speared a lot of fish and I was swimming out to a drop-off to try and capture a large species of dusky moorwong. I hope it was about 20 feet under the water and uh, snorkeling along with just no scuba tanks or anything with the spear gun in front of me and I had sighted a fish when all of a sudden a great thrash and a crunch in my left hand side. It grabbed me around the chest and I knew instinctively that it had to be a great white. And as you can see, it had its uh, the big triangular teeth, single teeth here. The doctors had to cut the wound right through here, get right inside and stitch up the, the lung and then the ribs and then the skin over the lot. I raced up to the surface and had one breath of air and got dragged down underwater as the shark grabbed hold of a big nylon boy I was towing and towed me through the water again. Miraculously, the, the cord that I was towing behind me had snapped and I managed to just float up to the surface and uh, a boat was on its way out, saw all the blood in the water and quickly pulled me on board and raced me into hospital where I was repaired fairly quickly. Rodney had more than 500 stitches. Undaunted by his brush with death, Rodney has perfected a technique for attracting the great whites. His formula of blood and tuna emulsion is continuously sprayed overboard, establishing a strong scent trail for the great whites to follow. In addition, large chunks of meat are hung over the sides. Chumming the waters, as this is called, can last for four or five days. Once the great whites are sighted, the shark cages are called into action. Take up a little, Terry, take up. The shark's arrival gave the team the opportunity they'd been waiting for. This was to be John McCosker's first chance to see the great whites in their own environment. first reaction is I grappled with that moving cage, held onto the wires and saw the shark coming at me about to grab the cage and what an abject fear and terror and fascination as well. It gave me an opportunity to finally see this animal I had read so much about. And I must say it's hard to put in words the feeling one has when one is in the water so small and that shark is so large. The opportunity to see it in its own environment taught me things that I could never have learned otherwise. I could really imagine what its prey must have felt, because I was its prey at that time. 
As a marine biologist, I suggest there's a certain irony because I felt that I had entered the shark's aquarium and it was looking at me. It is designed as the super predator. It's beautiful shape with its incredible strength and feeding apparatus. Make it the most fearsome animal in the ocean. I can only marvel at its strength, beauty, and grace. And at the same time, I'm terrified about its ability to eat me in a single bite. On this expedition, Dr. McCosker observed 13 different sharks. He was particularly interested in watching them eat, hopeful that examining their feeding behavior might provide clues as to why they attack. Incredibly, the team watched a single shark consume 200 pounds of meat, changing dramatically from a skinny to a fat beast in front of their eyes. I study the great white shark because it remains a fascinating enigma to me. This huge fish that's been swimming through the oceans for hundreds of millions of years is still relatively unexplained. We know so little about its behavior. We certainly know more about salmon and goldfish than we do about the great white shark. But I suspect that's because of the difficulty in studying it. Until we can look at a great white shark alive firsthand on a 24-hour basis, we'll really know very little about its whims, its behaviors, and its interests. San Francisco, I spend as much time as possible away from the confines of my office, chumming, attracting, looking, and trying to capture a live white shark, to return it to the aquarium to allow proper and controlled scientific studies, as well as an opportunity to let the public see their real jaws. It causes a little blood to squirt out of the can, it'll appear as if it were an injured animal. I had one incredible opportunity in 1980 when a fisherman called me and told me he had a live great white shark. He named her Sandy. She was seven and a half feet long and 350 pounds and caught in his net. He was a very wise fisherman and kept it alive long enough for us to drive to it, obtain her, put her in our truck and drive her back to the aquarium. That fisherman was a very wise and courageous fisherman. He tied a line to her tail. He didn't hit her with an oar as most fishermen do. He didn't put a hook in her. He was so careful and handled her so gingerly, I think the entire success is due to him. We also have learned since last year when we had a sick white shark that they require an awful lot of pure oxygen. They require circulation. We've been massaging her all the way through the transport procedure. And I think luck has played a lot in it. Of course, after all we'd been through, after all these years, the last thing I was going to do was risk the shark's life by watching it swim on its own. I had to be in there with it in case it needed help. Looking back at it, it was pretty foolish because no one had ever done this before. And I guess in a calm moment, if asked, would I jump in the water with a great white shark? I'd say, of course not. That would be nuts. That would be crazy. I was in a circular aquarium, and the shark was swimming around the circle soon to catch up with me. I lay on the bottom as flat as I could, and the shark swam right over my head. At first, we were very nervous about being in the tank with her when the light level was low, but we felt so confident after swimming all day with her that she wouldn't attack us, and she didn't attack us. Sandy caused a sensation in San Francisco. The aquarium opened its doors to thousands of people eager to catch a glimpse of the great white, and everybody had a different reason for coming. Yes. White sharks. Why? Say tear apart people. Uh, well, it's for him. See, he's never really seen a shark. He doesn't know what a shark really looks like, and I told him it wouldn't bite. On the first day alone, the aquarium had a 60% increase in attendance. More than 11,000 people waited in line to see the shark. Late that night, however, Sandy started behaving strangely, and Dr. McCosker was worried that something was very wrong. 
as the shark became healthier and healthier, it began to show some very aberrant behavior. The first thing we noted was the difficulty that it had with a small portion of the aquarium. It's circular in shape, but there was a five degree arc that we later measured that was difficult for the shark to swim by. She would swim towards it, sometimes do a 180 degree turn, sometimes collide rather strongly with that smooth portion of the wall. The second day she swam faster, collided more often. And by the third day, we tried to feed her. We put blood in the water, we added a variety of food items to the water, hoping that the other fishes would feed in the tank and that she would get the message from them. But she didn't feed. She was confused. Something relating to her feeding behavior was apparently linked to her collisions with a wall. Finally, we excluded all the possibilities. That was light levels, vibrations, sound, and we're left with electricity. We brought in an electronics engineer. The concrete tank with stainless steel window frames apparently was corroding. There was a weak electrolysis phenomenon going on that within that five degree arc made an electric hotspot. And this electric hotspot, as weak as it was, was very attractive to the shark. We asked the electrician, what could we do? to ground it, to stop this electrical phenomenon. He said, nothing. You must let the water out of the tank and repair it. Well, that leak was obviously responsible for its collisions and most probably responsible for its inability to feed. We thought about it and said, there's nothing we can do in terms of the long-term captivity of the shark. We can't fix the tank. We can't keep the shark anywhere else. We have no choice other than to let it go or to die in the aquarium. The response in San Francisco was immediate and phenomenal. People said, keep it alive, do everything you can, keep that shark alive. And as the shark got weaker after colliding with the tank, people said, let it go. People even came to us and said, we know it's a killer, but let it go, let it live. Although reluctant to part with her, John McCosker arranged quickly for Sandy to be trucked to a waiting boat. After only three days in captivity, Sandy had endeared herself to thousands of San Franciscans. So when the decision was finally made to release her, it was a media event. She was kept alive during the journey in a seawater-filled box continually pumped with oxygen. The lid was tightly secured for the choppy ride. We headed out for the Farallon Islands. It was a rough sea, and that fortunately probably helped her survive that long sea voyage because the sloshing within the box kept the water heavily oxygenated and made her muscles flex. We were fearful that after all she'd been through, another three hours in that boat ride might have killed her, but it certainly wasn't the case. Okay, pick up the whole thing. During the heavy seas, we lifted her head out of the water near the Farallon Islands and waited for the ship to roll down to the water line and all with a mighty heave, lifted her to the edge and dropped her in the water and she swam away. Here she goes. You got ten. She just went crazy. She got in the water and swam. Swam. Terry got a hand on her pectoral fin, but he couldn't even slow her down. We thought we were going to have to help her. We need more help than she had. The last time we saw her, she was at 60 feet and planing out. She's just going like a bat out of hell. That's one happy white shark. Sandy gave science and the public a chance to take a close look at a great white shark swimming in captivity, to learn about her species not just as mythic creatures, but as members of the ocean's community with a vital role to play. Great whites are the ocean's ultimate predator, and without them, the ecosystem would be severely disrupted. Many questions must be answered before scientists can predict shark behavior and perhaps aid in the prevention of shark attacks. Hopefully, further research will bring greater understanding 
so that one day the irrational fears we have of this majestic animal will diminish. And maybe then the true story of Jaws will be finally known.